Welcome to week five and to lecture four. In the first part of this lecture, we're going to be extending what we did so far on differential equations. Now, there are many systems where it's not enough to have just one differential equation in order to model the entire system. You end up needing more than one. Examples include things like a predator prey system. So for example, if we look at the Canadian lynx and the snowshoe hare, which we're going to look at in a lot of detail, these two species live in the same habitat and the lynx eat the hare. Um, so the lynx control the population of the hare who would otherwise kind of go exponential. So they're very tightly linked. And if you want to model this system, then you're going to need a differential equation for both the population of the hare and the population of the lynx. Um, and since the populations are changing over time, it's probably going to be a differential equation for each. So that gives you two differential equations. Another example, which we actually saw in the very first lecture when I was trying to convince you that mathematics was useful for modeling, um, is the idea if you're trying to model an epidemic, then you have different populations of people within the overall population. So you have the people who are susceptible, you have the people, people who are infected, and the people who have recovered. And again, each of the, the numbers of each of people in each of those is going to be changing, so you're going to have a differential equation for each of those populations. And they're obviously linked because susceptible people become infected, infected become recovered, and so you're going to have a linked system that you need to solve. Another example that you might see is in chemistry, where you have tanks of chemicals being produced, and one chemical is being used to produce another, and so you have different concentrations in the tanks over time and things moving from one tank to another. And again, if you're wanting to model a system like that, you're going to need to have differential equations, which talk about the change in the concentration of various chemicals. So overall, what we end up with is being able to need to solve not just one differential equation, but two or more differential equations together. To get a feel for this, we're going to go back to the first example I gave, which is that of the snowshoe hare and the Canadian lynx, because we have good data and it's really actually quite a fascinating system. So we're talking about North America here and Canada, and we have lots of hare and lots of lynx. And if there are enough hare, then pretty much that's all the lynx will want to eat. It's their preferred food. So we have a very tightly linked system of essentially a predator-prey where it's just the two uh, species working together. And in fact, we have incredibly good data heading back to 1821 from the Hudson Bay Company. So this is one of the oldest companies in the US and they used to get, uh, so they would send trappers out to Canada and North America to trap hare and lynx and then the pelts would be sent back uh, we don't obviously think this is a great thing anymore, but at the time it was like, yay, we've got lots of money coming in. And they kept really good numbers of the number of hair pelts and the number of lynx pelts that they got. And this gives a good estimate of the number of lynx and hair over time. And the thing that is interesting to note is that if you have a look at the data, so here we're, we're starting from around about, so we're starting from about 1821 and we're going all the way up to 1940. And if you look at the data, it initially looks kind of jagged, but notice that there is roughly a 10 year period in the cycles of each of these. So I'm looking at the blue, which is the hair. And if you have a look at the links, now the links, it's like their maxima are all happening a little bit after the maxima of the hairs. So it seems like there's some kind of periodicity going on here, some 10 year cycle in the populations of both of these, and they're obviously linked together. So let's see what we can do. Can, can we find a model which will actually give us something that looks like this? All right, well, what we want to do is we want to model two populations here. We're going to mo model the population of hair, so we'll use a big H because that's, you know, kind of logical. And we're going to model the links using big L. We're going to measure our time in years. And what we want to do is we want to develop a differential equation for each of the populations. So we want a differential equation which says how the population of hair change over time 
and we're going to assume that it's some function of both the number of links and the number of hair. And similarly, we want to find a differential equation for the number of links and how that changes over time. And again, also going to be a function of both populations. If you're wondering what I'm doing, adding, putting two, um, two inputs into a function, you can just think of it as what I'm putting in is a pair of numbers. So my single input is a pair of numbers. Um, there's no reason I can't put in two numbers and call that my input. Okay, let's build up this model. So let's start simply and assume that there are no links present. And to take our most basic possible assumption here, if there were no links, what would our little hairs do? Well, they do what bunnies do, they just reproduce crazily. We're going to assume that there's kind of plenty of food. So we're going to assume that they reproduce at a rate proportional to their population. So really we're thinking about exponential growth here, which we've seen before. So this is our first assumption. We're going to add more, but we're going to build it up bit by bit. Okay, so our first assumption is that if we don't have any links, then the rate of change of our hair population is going to be proportional to the numbers of hairs that we have. So this is our exponential growth model. Okay, but obviously there are links around. Um, so how do we include that? Well, the links are going to eat our little bunnies. Uh, sad but true. Okay, so let's. what we've got so far is we've got that our bunnies are increasing at a rate proportional to the number of them. But now some of them are going to get eaten. How many of them are going to get eaten? Well, what does it take for a lynx to eat a bunny? Um, well, let's not go into the gruesome details, but what needs to happen is they need to be in the same place at the same time. So we need to have some way of counting the number of interactions, the number of lynx hair interactions. And although you could come up with lots of different ways of doing that, um, the simplest way is just to say, well, let's put in a term of H times L. So if you think about this, if there are no linkses, then if this, so if this number is zero, then there'll be no interactions. On the other hand, if there are stacks and stacks of linkses, there'll be lots of interactions, so more bunnies will get eaten. Uh, likewise, if there are no bunnies, there'll be no interaction. If there are lots and lots of bunnies, then even if there are quite a few links, um, there'll be lots of bunnies, so there'll be lots more interaction, so more bunnies will get eaten. So this kind of works. Um, obviously, we don't know exactly what fraction of the lynx hair interactions um, will result in a bunny being eaten, so let's just put in a constant that's going to tell us what fraction um, will be eaten. Okay, and in this model, we're kind of assuming that our bunnies um, don't die other than by, eaten, by being eaten by a lynx. So this is as far as we're going to go with our bunnies. Okay, so we've got our two terms. This is the term that tells us how our bunnies reproduce. And this term, which subtracts off, tells us how our bunnies get eaten. Okay, so that's our bunnies sorted. All right, so now let's move on to our lynx population. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to think about what things contribute to growth in, a popu in the population of lynxes and what things contribute to a decrease in the population, just like we did with the bunnies. All right, so let's start out. So we're going to have our differential equation that says how the population changes over time. And the first assumption that we're going to make is that if there's no food, our lynx population will decline at a rate proportional to itself. If you want to think about, does this make sense? Well, imagine that our poor lynxes are starving because there's no food. Then in a given unit of time, a certain fraction of those lynxes will die. How do we put this into mathematics? Well, a certain fraction of our lynxes would be some constant times the current number of lynxes. So that's some fraction. And we're decreasing the population, so we need to have a minus sign. Okay. But it's not all bad news for our lynxes because actually there are plenty of hair around. And when our lynxes get to eat well, 
that means that they get to survive to maturity and then they can reproduce and make more lynxes. So we have a situation where there is a way in which our lynx population can, can increase. So let's just write down what we had so far. So here's what happens when our lynx population decreases. But our lynx population can also increase. And, our, and if we try to think about how could we, we show this, well, our lynx population increases when there's lots of food and they can eat. But we've already seen that, that the lynx hair interaction is kind of what happens when lynxes eat hairs. So we're going to use the same interaction. We're going to use L times H. And a, a fraction of those are going to result in new lynxes. So it's kind of, it's a, it's a chain. Uh, two lynx go off and do their eating thing, and then they reach maturity, and then they can mate and have more lynxes. So it's, it's a long chain, but we can still use the lynx hair interaction as a kind of placebo for that. So, and we're going to have a constant there to indicate that that's a fraction. Okay, so what we've really got all together now is a system of two differential equations that describe how our populations interact. So we've got the one that talks about our hair and a differential equation about our lynxes. And you'll notice that we can't just solve them separately because we have terms including, so if we look at our hair differential equation, we need to know about the population of the lynxes. And if we look at our lynx equation, we've also got our hair in there. So we need some way of solving these simultaneously. And a little bit later in the course, probably next week or the week after, we will start looking at how to solve systems of differential equations like this. Um, but we need to do a little bit more technical stuff before then. So for the rest of this lecture, we're going to see how much we can tell just from these two differential equations. Um, and we, it turns out we can actually do a lot, which I think is kind of fascinating. Okay, so let's look at a specific example here. So I've just put some numbers in. So uh, we've got the following system, the fraction at which our, our hairs reproduce is 0 0.4. We've got a 0 0.01 um, fraction of any hair links interaction results in uh, a little bunny dying. Over here, if there's no food, then in any given time interval, 0.3 of our lynxes will die. And over here, we're saying that 0.005 is the fraction of hair lynx interactions, which result ultimately in a new lynx. Okay, so I've just put some numbers in, and we're going to need um, an initial population. So let's suppose that we start off with 70 hair and 50 links. So what can we do without actually solving these differential equations? Well, one thing to do is to essentially numerically integrate or use a numerical algorithm to solve a system, which sounds very fancy, but it's not really. So what do we do? Well, let's just make a note of what our two equations are here. All right, so this tells us um, how our hair population and our lynx population change over time. So we're starting, we're assuming that we start out at t equals zero with 70 hair and 50 lynx. So at time t equals zero, what is the value of our rate of change of hair and rate of change of lynx? Well, we can just plug our 70 into wherever we see an H there, and our 50 wherever we see an L. And if you do that for both our dH by dt and our dL by dt, then you will find out that the rate of change of our hair is minus 7. So when we start out with 70 hair and 50 links, obviously we've got enough links that on the whole they're tending to eat more bunnies than are being reproduced. Okay. On the other hand, what's happening with our lynxes? If you plug in our 70 and our 50, you get 2.5. So this is telling us that 
when you have 70 hair and 50 lynxes, the lynxes are doing super well. They're not dying off. They've got enough food that they're actually managing to reproduce. Okay, so we've got a system where our number of bunnies is going down and our lynxes is going up. Okay, what do we do? Well, we imagine one year later, and although we know that it's probably not a linear system, um, we make an approximation and we say, okay, well, one year later, we'll have 70 minus seven hair, which will give us 63. And we'll have 50 plus 2.5 links, which will give us 52.5. Okay. And now we just rinse and repeat. So at t equals one year, with our new population of 63 and 52.5, what are the rates of change? Well, if you plug in 63 and 52.5, you'll get minus 7.88 and 0.79. And you can actually just put this into a spreadsheet. Um, it's a little bit tedious because you have to kind of update each bit, um, or you could write an algorithm, which is mostly what um, gets done these days. Um, okay, so let's have a look. So at the end of year one, what's happening? Well, our bunny population is still decreasing. So obviously the lynxes are taking out a lot of bunnies, enough that the bunny reproduction isn't counteracting that. But you'll notice that the number of lynx that we've got, I mean, the, the rate of change of lynx is, has fallen. So we've obviously got enough lynx, but they're not getting to eat quite as much as they were previously and able to re reproduce quite so much, but they're still doing well. So they're still on the increase. Okay, so now we plug in those two numbers um, to see. So now we've got 63 minus 7.88, and that's going to give us, four, that's not right. Uh, okay, so this is going to give us, so this will have 52.5, minus 0.79 is going to give us 50, 51 point something, and our 63 is going to give us our 57, I think, something like that. Okay, I think my numbers have got a bit crazy, but again, at the end of at, the, at looking at year two with our new numbers, so you can you can check what those are. Um, we can work out our rate of change again. And here you'll notice that you get something like 5.7, minus 5.7. And over here you get minus 1.3. So you'll notice that our rate of change of our lynxes has shifted from having a population that's increasing to a population that's now decreasing. On the other hand, our bunnies, um, their population is still decreasing, um, but less than it was before. So it was all the way up at almost eight bunnies decreasing, but now it's decreasing at minus 5.7. And in fact, if you work out um, these numbers going forward, you can plot a graph of what your populations will look like. Um, and I recommend that you do it because it's quite fun, but I'll, uh, spoiler alert, uh, this is what we get. So notice what's happening here. This is actually mimicking what we see in the real data, which is that we get a periodic solution. So there's quite a lot going on here. So our red is our hairs and our blue is our lynxes. And we're starting at 70 and 50 for the respective populations. And as we saw, initially, our hair population is decreasing. Uh, and so that's what we see over here. Our hair population decreases initially. Um, and initially, our lynx population is increasing for a little bit, just a couple of years, and then it starts decreasing. Um, and you'll notice as we head further on so that we can start to see what's happening, notice that our bunny population will reach a maximum and a little bit later 
our lynx population will reach a maximum, which kind of makes sense. So the lynx population is lagging after the bunny population. So the bunnies are doing really, really well. The lynxes start to get eat a lot more. And a little bit later, their population grows because they've been able to reproduce more. Um, but And because you've got more lynx, they're eating the bunnies. And so the bunny population starts to fall. And as the bunny population starts to fall, it eventually gets to a point where the lynx population starts to fall because it's not getting enough food. And now there are fewer lynxes putting pressure on the bunnies, so the bunnies can start to reproduce again, and then this means there's more food for the lynx, so the lynx can eat more bunnies, and so on and so on. And we get this really, I think, quite amazing oscillating pattern. That So you'll notice that I don't have um, the period quite right, so the period that we've got here is around 20 years, whereas the Hudson Bay data is about 10 years. So you could play around with um, with the, the factors that we have here and see if you could get it to being about 10 years if you felt like it. Um, okay, so this looks like it might actually be quite a good model um, if we got the factors right, so that we got the period right. Um, but we can actually do more with, with what we've got. So notice we haven't actually solved. We don't know what the equations are for these two lines. We've just figured this out by literally integrating year by year, figuring out, okay, after year one, this is how many we've got. After year two, this is how many we've got. But we don't know what the equation is. But we can still do some more. So when looking at systems of differential equations, particularly two differential equations, we can plot things slightly differently by plotting, for example, here we're plotting our number of hairs on the x-axis and our number of links on the y-axis. And initially this looks a little bit strange, but you'll see that there's an arrow on this blue line here. And what this tells us is this is the population, the points, so each, each point on here represents the number of hair and the number of links at a particular time. So if we wanted to look at where we started at, we started with 70 hair and 50 links. So we started with 70, 50, so that's about here. So we started at time t equals to zero, we had 70 hair and 50 links. And then if you remember what happened when we worked out our numbers over here, our number of hair went down and our number of links went up. And so you can see over here, our number of hair decreased and our number of links went up, and so we move to this point over here. And then again, some. so this was at probably time t equals 1. And then again, we had a similar, we had a decrease in the number of hair, but a small increase in the number of links, so that's approximately t equals 2. But then by the time we started getting somewhere over here, so I don't know exactly what our time steps are, but by, for example, maybe t equals 3 over here, now we've got them both decreasing. So when we go from, for example, t equals 2 to t equals 3, our number of links decreases and our number of hair also decreases. But, by, but you might get down to around about, for example, this looks like uh, 40, 45-ish. So 45, 40. And now you start to see here, although your lynx population is decreasing, now your bunny population starts to increase until you get to somewhere around about over here. And on this part of the curve, both populations are increasing. And then you start having your bunnies decrease, bunnies decrease all the way up to here. And now uh, lynxes links decrease, bunnies decrease, and the cycle continues. 
So although it's a bit of an odd looking curve, it is actually quite useful. Um, it tells you a lot that's going on. Obviously, the important thing here is this arrow, which tells you which direction time's going in. But wait, there's more. So we can actually also plot direction fields in the phase plane, which is going to tell us more. So this was our particular solution. So this was our solution for our lynx population starting at 50 and our bunny population starting at 70. But we might want to have a more general idea of what solutions look like. And if you remember, we, we drew um, slope fields like this for differential equations previously. Um, and this is a similar idea, but it's for systems of linear equations. So I've still got um, my number of my population of hair on the x-axis and links on the y-axis. And what I'm going to do is at each point, I'm plotting a vector that represents the overall change in population. So for example, if we think about where we started, we started at 70, 50, which was over here. And we've got a little vector over here. What, where does that come from? Well, we remember we figured out that if we work out the rate of change of our hair population at our initial point, so at 7050, we worked out that that was minus 7. So if we were to plot that minus 7 on here, we would probably plot it as a little arrow going that way, just parallel to the x-axis because that's the direction that our hairs change that their numbers in. Um, and I realize this is not anywhere near big enough. Okay, let's, let's let me write this again. And I'll make this a little bit smaller so we can see it. Okay, so here we are at 7050. And we know that our hair population changes at minus at a rate of minus seven at that point. On the other hand, we know that our lynx population increases at 2.5. And the net result, which I'm going to just make a bit bigger here, is this overall change in population here, which is the sum of those two vectors. Now we're gonna do a little bit of vector recap in the next part, but I just wanted to kind of show that vectors crop up all over the place. So to finish off what I was saying, we've got, we know that at our initial point of 70, 50, our lynx population is increasing at a rate of 2.5 per year. And so this blue vector that we've got here is really the vector you get with minus 7, 2.5, and positioning it at the point 7050. And so you can go through, and at every point, you can find the overall change in your population by looking at the change in, in, in x, which is our hair, and the change in y, which is our links, and that will give you a new vector, and it'll have a different magnitude. Okay. So one of the things you might notice looking at this is it really looks like there's something interesting happening round about here. Like everything is kind of swirling around that particular point. And in fact, this is an important point. And if you imagine, it looks like as you get closer and closer to that point, you seem to just circle it more and more. And it's possible that if you were at that particular point, the populations wouldn't move at all. So if you think about starting at, say, roughly uh, just under 60, 40, well, you've got a tiny little change there which will move you up slightly and then back and then back and you'll kind of circle round. So what is going on at that point? Well, we've already talked a little bit about equilibrium solutions. These are solutions where 
the thing that we're interested in isn't changing, so where the rate of change is zero. And we can talk about equilibrium so solutions for systems of differential equations. We do exactly the same thing. We say, okay, well, we want to find what values of h and l give us a situation where our derivative, so remember this was uh, dh by dt, and this was dl by dt, and we're setting each of those equal to zero. Well, you can just solve these two equations, it's not too difficult, and you'll find that there are actually two solutions. At the point zero, zero, we have an equilibrium solution, and at the point 60, 40, we have an equilibrium solution. What do these two solutions mean? Well, they're quite logical. Well, certainly the zero, zero is quite logical. If you don't have any hair and you don't have any links, that's not going to change. It's just going to stay there. You've got a barren wasteland with no hair and no links forever. And if we have a look over here, that would be... So let's do a bit of highlighting. So our zero, zero would be this point over here. So if you happen to have that particular popul unfortunate population of zero links, zero hair, it's going to stay like that forever. But we have another option, which is 60-40, and that population is roughly over here. And that says that if you reach this magical number of having 60 hair and 40 links, then the number of hair that are being eaten by the links is exactly balanced by the number of hair that are being reproduced. And similarly, the number of links that are dying from lack of food is exactly being balanced by the number of links that are being born. And so because these two factors in each case cancel out, you just have constant populations. So this is not saying that the same individuals stay alive forever. It's just saying that essentially the birth and death rates are exactly the same. And so you have a stable population. Okay, so that's actually quite a lot that we figured out without even solving the differential equations. Um, but there's a little bit more that we can do if we make our model a little more sophisticated. So it might seem unreasonable to model our hair population as just growing exponentially. And one thing we could do is say, well, okay, uh, our logistic model work might work better. So we can do that here. So what we're changing, the only thing that we're going to change in our new model is this term over here. So previously we just had 0.4h, so we said that our hair were growing exponentially, um, but now we're, increase, we're including this factor over here, which says that we have a carrying capacity of 80. So we've shifted from exponential growth to logistic for our, our hair, but other than that, we've changed nothing. So we're still saying that 0.01 of our hair links interactions result in the death of our hair, and we haven't changed our links population at all. So having made this modification, what does this do? Well, we can play the same game and we can numerically figure out the answer. And if you do that, so we're taking the same initial populations, you get quite a different looking curve. So notice here, we're starting out at 70 and 50. And immediately, our lynx population starts to go down, and our hair population goes down, they both decrease. Um, but when our lynx population gets low enough, now obviously there are not enough links to be kind of taking out too many bunnies, so the bunnies are able to reproduce again, and the bunnies head up to what looks like a stable number of around 60. Our links keep decreasing until they get to quite a lower level, but then they also stabilize. So we have a, a, a very different situation where now we've kind of reached an equilibrium um, starting from the same place that we did before. So we've just changed our model a little bit to say our, our rabbits have 
a, a, a capacity beyond which the land won't support them. And now suddenly we've got a very different model. What does it look like um, if we find the equilibrium solutions? Again, you could plug this in. So to find your equilibrium solutions, remember you just, you set these equal to zero and solve for H and L. And if you do that, you'll find in this case, there are actually three equilibrium solutions. So there's zero, zero, which is what you would expect. Um, we've seen that one before. So that's our zero, zero over there. Then we've got another one, which is 60, 10. So that's sitting at a roundabout here. And then we have a, another one at 80, zero, which should come, should come as no surprise. It's sitting over here. So let's think about what these three equilibria are talking about. Well, this is the same one that we've seen before, zero, zero. You start out with nothing, you end up with nothing. And in fact, this one is pretty clear as well, 80, zero. If you don't have any links who are preying on your hairs, then we've just got our carrying capacity, which is going to affect the number of hairs. And we set that carrying capacity back here up at 80. So it shouldn't be a surprise that we have a solution down here. But what about this 6010? Well, this doesn't look quite like the solution that we saw before, particularly as if you start at different points. So if you start at 7050, you'll notice that our population decrease and then gradually increase again and they actually reach a stable point over here and that's what we saw in this image here so we've got our equilibrium being reached but what's interesting is in fact if you take pretty much any starting population other than 0, 0 or 80, 0, eventually you're always going to end up at this particular pair of populations at your 60, 10. And this is a particularly interesting feature of some systems of differential equations. It's called a stable equilibrium because no matter where you are outside of that equilibrium, eventually as the system evolves you will end up at that equilibrium it's kind of like it draws the population there every time so you can play around um, with these things and check that I'm, I'm not telling you anything particularly weird um, i'm pretty sure i did the calculations correctly uh, so even if you start out for example over here we've got stacks and stacks of links and not very many bunnies um, and you might think, well, okay, then the links would just die out. Um, the numbers certainly decrease, but eventually you get to a point where there are few enough links and enough bunnies that the bunnies can start to increase. And eventually you get enough bunnies that the links can start to increase. And finally you get to your equilibrium point again. You can start out over here and the same thing happens just a little bit quicker and you could check that if you started out way over here you'd have the same thing so in this particular model all points lead to 60 10. you end up with a stable um, a stable population of both links and hair and remember that was just a little change that we made going from exponential growth for the bunnies to logistic so you might be wondering uh, what are the key points that you need to know? Well, from today's lecture, which was mar largely discursive, um, there is stuff that you need to know. So firstly, you need to know that we sometimes need to use systems of differential equations. And one way that we can essentially solve these uh, for different initial conditions is just numerically. So we haven't done any techniques for solving the systems, but we can still get an answer. 
would I ask you to do this in a test or exam? Uh, I might ask you to do the first calculation, like I did um, just working out what the first, the derivative at time t equals zero and the derivative at time t equals one is, but I wouldn't expect you to do more than that. Um, in terms of plotting, we know that we can plot our solutions as functions of time or on a phase plane. It's useful to be able to plot points, um, but again, unless you have access to a computer, you're not going to plot the whole curve. Um, you can also plot direction fields, and we saw how to do that, looking at the value of the derivative of each population and using that to create a new vector which gives us the total change in populations. And then we also talked about equilibrium solutions, and these you do need to be able to solve for. Remember, this is where you just set the derivatives equal to zero, and then you solve. And then we also finally talked about a stable equilibrium, which is an, equi an equilibrium to which all other solutions tend as time goes on. And even if for some reason the population moves away from the stable equilibrium, so maybe mm, there's a disease and a lot of the rabbits die out, so suddenly you've got a change, Nonetheless, eventually, providing you don't have no rabbits left, um, you will get back to that equilibrium. We don't know how to solve specifically for stable equilibria. That's not something we've learned. Um, but you should be able to calculate the equilibrium solutions. All right, so in the next part of this lecture, we will be looking at a bit of revision for vectors and matrices because it turns out that we're going to need those in order to be able to solve systems of differential equations. All right, see you in a bit.